my name is Shane Jones and first of all I would just like to thank Richard and Joe and everybody associated with Common Aid House for all the tremendous work they put into this whole event and it certainly made our lives much much easier so all those guys and ladies involved thank you so much um, I'm a tree surgeon and as a result I come across obviously lots and lots of wood in my time and I do spend probably too much of my time on the more destructive aspects of wood where we fell trees or we trim them back and then put everything through the chipper and everything's annihilated and a few years ago I started to have a bit of a conscience about the need for something more constructive and my mind sort of went back to the days of low level woodwork and things like that I thought I'm going to start making a few things so I redis rediscovered that enthusiasm and decided it would be nice to make some things that I could manage because I, I wouldn't have professed and still don't profess to be an expert. And I started making little things in the shed and my grandson actually came along because he was four and a half, nearly five at the time. And he was full of enthusiasm. What are we going to do, Granddad? Let's do it. So he made a couple of things like bird boxes and little wooden dinosaurs, which uh, little children love and I can manage to make. So that was a good start. But then we started to get a bit more clever. And I'd seen on YouTube people making these things. This is actually called a, what was it called? A bandsaw box. Because you make it on a, on a particular saw, which I'll show you in a while. But it's made out of one huge piece of wood and the drawers are just made out of pieces of contrasting colour and cut to you know, sort of random shapes and they, they, it ju you just end up with a sort of fun little thing. And this could be made in about two hours quite comfortably. So we started making things like this and Seth and myself had a great time. And then along came the dreaded lockdown. And suddenly I found myself alone because Seth couldn't come round anymore with me and it was down to me to make some stuff and I was a bit stuck for a while and then my artistic other half Rosemary actually came up with a, she came up with a really good suggestion because she had started making as you may have seen in another video some lampshades and she said to me look you, you're making things can you make me something that I can display my lampshades on which was a perfectly reasonable suggestion and I started thinking about shelves and hanging devices and so on and then Rosemary really sort of hit me between the eyes and said well why don't you make some lamps you know what better to display lampshades on so I decided yeah why not Let, let's do that and I had tons of wood laying around from various sources so decided to give that a go and I sort of had a look on YouTube, I had a look on the internet, and you find all sorts of things on there. I'll get onto that in a little while. But um, that was really the start of it, to making these, these actual lamps. I realised at that point that having basically something like a coping saw and a spoke shave and a very basic other saw wasn't really going to be enough to make stuff that's going to serve as a half decent looking piece of furniture for people and I therefore had a good excuse to go out and buy a few upgrades to my kit and you'll see some of that in a little while so I armed myself with the equipment but of course I needed the skills I'd like to think I had some of them from my you know, 1970s woodworking at school but that wasn't enough um, it took a lot of practice on little pieces that didn't matter, and also looking at YouTube videos, watching the experts. But gradually, you know, if you pay attention and try things and find what works for you, and you get some half decent tools, if you use things like this, where you've got a 90 degree guide, you know, you can end up making what you intend to make rather than what comes out. So that's that's sort of how, how it all came about. And with the lockdown, it was just a case of get out there, make some stuff. Rosemary had goodness knows how many lampshades by this point, so I knew the pressure was on to make enough lamps. So 
what I want to do today is to give you some insight into that process. You know, the background was the, you know, as I've just explained, the lockdown opportunity, if you like, and the need, there was a, a driven need to actually put some map shades on things. And it's really a state, a case of, first of all, you have to design something. You, know, you can just go out into the shed and potter about, but you want to be, have some idea in your mind. And if you look online, you will find millions of different designs of maps. There's basic monoliths where people get a piece of wood and stick something in the top and say, I've made a lamp. There are very scientific things that when you look at it, you think, I don't see how that's worked, how that can be done. How have they put that together? Some very complicated things. Some people even just get old wooden bits and pieces. I have one here. This is a very old woodworking plane. And if you look on eBay, you will actually see some of these literally with a light bulb bolted on the front end saying lamp. And you think, well, okay, good luck. I'm, I'm glad you made that. Um, but then if somebody buys it, then it's, it's a success. That's the whole thing, isn't it, with art? We've got this free reign. If we think it, you know, if we think we can make it and we want to make it, and one person buys it, we're there. And that's that's what it's all about. It's the beholder. If they behold it and pay money for it, that's brilliant. So the design I find comes in one of two ways. Either the old brain starts ticking over and says, hey, what we want is a rocket, or what we need is a lamp that looks like a lighthouse, because you've got the, the double whammy there of a lighthouse, light, yes, it, and it all, you know. So that's one thing, and then you've got to go away and work out how to make it. The other alternative, the other driver, is suddenly, for whatever reason, you come across something that just shouts at you, a piece of wood. And a couple of years ago, we were cutting down a maple tree in Broadwater, and it was covered in these burrs. You may have seen these things on the side of trees. Nothing special on the outside, just a horrible knobbly bit. But if you cut through it and get flatten it out, you actually end up with something absolutely stunning. It's like a slab of marble made out of wood. The grain disappears in all directions and reappears elsewhere in spots and blobs. And I have here, one I prepared earlier, one where I've started working on this, and you can see how it starts to come up with this incredible pattern. Well, I say pattern, it's, it's just a, a total random. But it is so unusual to look at. And that is just a case of slicing it, getting it flat, preparing it. And you've got, this is, Rosemary's just asked me, this is actually an, another piece of the maple burr. This is a huge chunk from inside it. So it, they were fairly massive pieces. So you can have the timber itself makes its own suggestion and that gives you your, your design. So there's the, the sort of two ways of, or my two drivers. And what I tend to do is I would take something like this or a bigger piece and cut a small sample and then try, see what happens when you put it through the cutters, through the saw, through the planer, when you sand it, what sort of finish, is it workable, is it just going to shatter? You've got to establish that it's going to be a goer before you get too involved. But, you know, you, you try it out, you have that iterative process, and sometimes when you cut it into pieces, that gives you other ideas as well. So the whole thing is all about see what happens. If the end result looks really good to somebody, it's a success. It's got to be safe, it's got to hang together, but you know, it's, that's what it's all about. So that's the sort of part of the design of it. Once you've got that design through whichever process you've gone through, it's a question of then building the lamp. Now, you always start, or I always start, with pieces of wood. And the piece of wood you've got can be massive, like the ones you saw at the very start of the video, 
Sometimes, as a chap I know, he does out outdoor oak buildings. And you may have seen these things in people's driveways where they have an out, you know, a, an oak framed um, pergola, an oak framed garage or whatever. And occasionally I get given, unfortunately, off cuts like this of oak, and that is solid oak. Now, that's far too big for a lamp. No one's going to want that on their table. It's just flat on the table. Maybe they would. But it needs to be cut down. And there's almost a hierarchy of equipment that you use to get the, to get the wood down to the size you want. For me, being a tree surgeon, stage one of a huge piece of wood, I'll reach for the chainsaw and cut it. The disadvantage of a chainsaw is it's not that safe if you don't know what you're doing and you have to have all the safety equipment on. But I could cut any size of timber down to a manageable chunk. I'm not going to demonstrate a chainsaw. You know what they're like and they're so noisy. It's, it's not necessary today. But that will be my first option. The next option for the next size down is you know, something this sort of size Really, the, the next severe saw in the process is this. This is called a band saw. And it's, see that, but it's got a wheel on the top, a wheel on the bottom, and it's got a blade, which is actually a continuous band that just goes round and round, driven by the motor. And as you cut the wood, it just goes through there at about 20 miles an hour or whatever the speed of it is and it goes through a reasonable speed, not quite that fast, but this is exactly the same as they have at sawmills where they cut up you know, great big oak trunks and that into big slabs to produce the sort of timber that you see at your local timber store. So I'll give you a, a demo of that later. And you can see that in action, cutting up, say, a piece of this. So that's, that's the second stage. When you're making smaller pieces, you can use something like this. This is called the table saw. And here is a blade which revolves. Well, you can wind it up and down up to about 55, 60, 60 millimeters high. So these probably won't quite go through that way in one go, but you could flip it over and go through from both sides and I could cut that in half. There'll be a little ridge down the middle and it would be a little bit marked, but it would leave a much nicer edge than is left by this one. So that's, if you like, slightly smaller pieces of timber, but you get a, a neater finish. There's also this thing, which is a mitre saw, which again, you'll see on most building sites, most carpenters are, who come round, will have one of these and they'll you just put your timber in there and it's very good at just cutting across slicing pieces of wood it will angle so you can have around to 45 degrees if you want to make mitres to make a square frame and that sort of thing and that gives you a nice finish as well so that's cutting the timber down to size the when the timber is somewhere near the right size you want to get a nice finish on it. Now, this machine over here is absolutely incredible. I'm not going to turn this one on today because I'm, I, I, I'm too keen on the neighbours. They're nice people. It's not very quiet, it's not very, uh, quiet at all. It, it's quite noisy. It does is you can put a rough edged piece of timber on this end. And when you start it up, there's a roller that goes round here with a table is slightly higher than that table. So the cutter will cut it down. It basically cuts the bottom off of it. So it will slide nice and smoothly onto this one. And you cut through it. It will go down about three millimetres at a time, but that's a bit harsh. But what you can do, you, you cut it, you put it through, and it will come along this edge. And as you pull it along, if it's rocking, because it's still uneven, no matter, you just lift it up, pull it down, pull it through again, and you keep doing that until it comes along dead flat, and you will have a dead flat surface. And 
true Blue Peter style. Here's one I did the other day. This is a this is started life as a U log. I put it through the bandsaw to get it roughly flat, and then after a couple of trips through the planer, we have this finish on the surface. It it's almost shiny. In fact, it is shiny in places, but. It, hopefully you can see from the camera, it's dead flat, both across and long ways. And that gives you a really perfect reference point for the rest of the work, because once you've got one flat surface that you know is flat, you can then put that against here. This is 90 degrees to the bed, and then you can run it through whatever shape it is, and you'll end up with a perfect 90 degree joint um, angle. You can then continue that process, flipping it round and round as much as, as much as you need, and you'll end up with a perfectly rectangular length of timber, and off you go. Once everything's 90 degrees, when you're doing complicated things, it's a great start, and you're away. So that's that. So that's the preparation of the timber. And what I'll do now is I'll show you a couple of these things working and we've seen just what how it works. Let's get a piece of wood. This is a piece of oak. I'm fond of my oak. And what we do, if we're going to cut the length, my advice is always with these saws, you have to blade just above the thickness of the timber. When people say to you, how high should you have your blade? The answer is usually, how much of your fingers can you afford to lose? Keep it down as low as you can. Fence across. This is dead parallel with that. I've got it all set up. And now when I run this through, I should get a nice straight cut. And I can keep with the fence in the same place I can take as many pieces of wood as I like put through there and I've got every single piece of timber is exactly the same way so before I do that I put my air defenders on and we'll just give this a go I will also use the pushing stick again safety device well away from the machine Here we have a nice straight line. So it's not quite perfect. It would need to be planed down or sanded or just finished off before it's assembled. But you can see that is very, very close to a really nice, perfect piece of wood. So you can cut lengths of timber that way. Then if you want, if you've got a long piece of wood and you want lots of shorter pieces and you want them all exactly the same length, that's where you can use something like this. Just take and stop from here, put it up again, put the piece of wood up there. Um. So they match perfectly. You can keep on going, you can make hundreds and hundreds of pieces of wood very quickly using that. Then I'm going to put my ears back on for the next one. I'll just demonstrate the severity, you know, the, how how good this bandsaw is by cutting through this piece of oak. And this is assuming we just want to make this half the size, let's say. Normally, I would I would put this against the fence to keep it dead straight, so they're parallel. But so that you can see what's going on, I'll push it through by hand about halfway through, so I'm not going to risk my fingers. But you'll see see how I cut through this.
Apologies for that. Obviously, a little bit of wiggle in the blade, and it didn't want to get back, go back out. But there we have one piece of oak where we had one bit which was much too thick. Now we've got two bits, just the thickness we need for the next part of the job. So that's those two. I've described how this one works. There's other machines as well, but I don't really want to sort of bore you all to death with. Uh, you know, it's not a woodwork class, it's how I make lamps more importantly. So there we are, there's, there's the, uh, the machining down of, of the material. So, sometimes your lamp is just going to be a single piece of oak or whatever it is. And as an example, Richard, if you could just put up the picture of Hydra, please. is now okay so hydra that was a single piece of oak you've accidentally muted rosemary okay so is that okay better now you okay on the technical side there yeah no the, i muted it my mistake oh, right. okay. <laughs> okay, so there we are. That's a nice simple one. Now, the uh, another fairly simple one is the, the driftwood, and I've had a couple of driftwood pieces. Um, I think Richard, if you could just put Perseus up for me, please. Sure thing. Thank you. Right, well, with the driftwood, he's just doing it. With the driftwood, you, you don't really want to machine it down or, or plane it or anything like that. You want to leave that raw effect of how it came out of the sea. So the important things really are just cutting off a flat base so it will stand up on someone's table. And then the rest of it is just tidying it up as much as you can. If, if there are broken bits, they can be chiseled off and sanded down. It can be, it, they need to be rinsed to get the salt out, rinsed and dried, rinsed and dried, rinsed and dried, and so on, until they look really just just right. And then once that's done, they're finished, they can go into the, the sort of the final electrification process, if you like, of putting all the bits on. Now, you can have more complex designs. And some of mine have become fairly uh, excited, excitable in the way that's happened. Um, an example is when you want to get two pieces of, if you have two pieces of timber, which are contrasting colours, and this is where you can play with all different colours of timber. This is a piece of pine and a piece of walnut, side by side. Now you can see that if you keep on joining them together across, you'd end up with like a giant barcode or zebra or whatever you want to call it. And if they're all nicely machined edges and flattened down, they'll glue together beautifully. So you end up with a sort of a nice flat surface. And you can then cut that and glue it again and again, and you can do all sorts of things. Here's, here's a section of what I've cut from a lamp which I made a while back. And this is, again, just two different colors of timber joined together, glued up, machine down fairly flat but you could take it a stage further you can cut across several times and join it if you flip the alternate ones you'll end up with something like this just by cutting joining flipping over joining and so on now this as you probably noticed resembles a chessboard and over here 
into what Sarah was saying this morning. Here's a chessboard that I made a while back. This was a prototype. There's a few little things that didn't quite go perfectly with it. So at the moment, we play chess on it, but uh, it's not really as sellable as such. But they're two quite close shades, not too contrasting. I just did that because I thought it looked a bit more interesting. And on the reverse side, I made myself a Scrabble board so that that just flips over on the table and we can play Scrabble on a homemade board. How about that? There we are. So that's some of the complex designs. Now, with those, those complex ones I was talking about, when you start laminating, um, you can obviously end up with the, I think somewhere, I've lost my track here, Maybe it'd be a good chance for me to ask one of the questions that just came yeah, through. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Um, so Sarah just asked, I've had a few questions, but I, I think some of them will be better placed at the end. But one question that just came through is, how do you join the pieces from Sarah? Uh, very, very valid question. The pieces, when you have pieces like this, what you do is you set up some clamps I've got here a whole shelf of clamps. And you, can, you can clamp two together like this while they're gluing. That's one way. But if, you're, if you've got lots that you're doing, then I have got here somewhere. It may seem a little overkill, but if you bear with me. Really. The important thing with gluing up is that everything has to be held really tightly together. If it's not clamped tight, then it won't hold. So what we do is we have this racking. I've got this rack system, and essentially what we do is. well you can see this but you have these clamps that go that set up in a frame like this and there will be another one here or however far apart it needs to be and then you put your pieces you slide them in one after another in whatever pattern you want to make and there's I think there's one here somewhere where I had several different colours all clamped together like this so they're clamped in or they're glued, clamped together, and left to dry for a few hours. And then you can just lift them out, and there'll be a bit of glue down each side on all the joints. And you can then put those either, you can sand it off, you can plane it off, you can wipe it off while it's still slightly damp with a wet cloth. But you tidy it up, you can plane it all down, get it beautiful and smooth so that the none of the glue shows, and you end up with you know that sort of finish. So that's how the pieces are glued together or how they're joined together. And likewise, if we wanted to make a really complicated pattern, we could cut this across. And I've got some here. As you can imagine where I've got these slices, if you offset them, and the lip, you know, your, your imagination is the limit. You can do whatever you want with them. You can have them offset randomly in a nice little pattern, glue them up, cut these edges off, re-glue it time and time again, and you can make the most complicated thing. The only thing is, so you're spending a lot of time gluing up, but that's, that's okay. If the end result justifies it, why not? But it's all done with, you know, all done with glue just to make them, you know, whatever pattern you want. Can get very what type of glue is that? Sorry? What type of glue? Uh, I'll show you. It's tight bond. All the builders, merchants sell it. Any wood shop will sell it. Um, I, I think I bought this from Wenban Smiths in Worthing. It comes as three different standards. There's a one, two, and three. And I think three is fully waterproof and takes several hours to dry. This dries a bit quicker, so when you're gluing stuff together, you've got to make sure it's all clamped up in position within about an hour of, of starting. 
which if you're making something complicated can be quite hair raising but it's it's all part of the fun so that's the glue great thank you is it making sense so far for you guys oh i think so yeah so like i said i've got some extra questions for the end of the, the session I think it's right okay um Richard, could you just put up the Orion and or Pegasus for me, please? Sure thing. A couple of examples of lamps made out of the build-up of different cross-sections then glued on top of each other. And just, just examples of the fun you can have. There we go. Yep. Okay, we back on. Yep. Okay, so that's those. Now I've talked about simple design, complex design. So far, everything has been, you know, sort of joining things together, gluing them up, and making patterns. There is one other option. Well, there's probably many other options, but one is where you use things called finger joints, where you make a whole side of a lamp and another side of a lamp, and you join them together on the corners with a finger joint or a box joint. I mean, you could use dovetails if you want to as well, but you know, whatever you want to do. But this is quite good. It's a very strong joint because you've got lots of area for gluing up. And you can imagine that if these two pieces of wood were different colours, you would actually get quite a striking end result. So, Richard, if you could have put up for me, please, uh, Crux. It's there for you. Okay, so there's, a, there's an example of two different coloured pieces of wood, just nothing too flashy done to them, but just finger joints done down the side glued together and if I remember rightly that's also got another slither of wood on the edge of the finger joints but there's, there's various other tricks you can do it, you can do inlays by cutting grooves you can do all sorts of things but I, I do like the result of using contrasting sides you get a really nice finish on it okay thank you Richard um now so far, I've talked about um, making these, these joints. I was going to give you a demo of the finger joints, but you'll just have to trust me that there's a jig that makes it easier. There's, there's another thing that's probably a little bit more interesting, and that is if you want to make something that isn't dead square. So far, we've been talking 90 degree cuts. All the machines on here so far, I've been showing you 90 degrees, 90 degrees. But sometimes, and there are two pieces of work that I've produced recently where 90 degrees is not what I wanted. One of them was the lighthouse um, lamp, which I think was called caster. Yes. Richard, could you just put caster up for me, please? There for you. Okay, smashing. Thank you. Now, you'll notice on that, it's six-sided. And are we back on? Yeah. yeah. So well, each... Well, the, the lamp's still there. All right. Yeah. Right. Each of those sides yeah, okay. is identical. But it, ha it has to be. It's symmetrical. And here are two pieces cut using the same technique. So you can see they taper in at the top by a certain amount. And also, the joints on the end, they can't be 45 degrees, otherwise it would be square. They have to be cut at a different angle. Now, the joy of this is that this saw that I described to you earlier, the table saw, it does have a facility to make the blade tilt over. And you can adjust the angle of tilt to get whatever angle you want for getting those joints. So you can make a six-sided thing. That, however, is only half of the problem. Because if it was just, if that's all you did and then put it through the table saw straight the other way, 
you would just end up with a pipe, a hexagonal pipe with everything parallel. But to get that taper, what you've got to do is to stop the saw from cutting parallel. And what you do with that is you have a jig like this. And this, if I hold it up, both sides are dead straight and parallel. And you run this side along. You set the, you set the uh, fence up on here, which is perfect, which is ninety degrees to the edge of the table. But you work out the angle that you want your taper to be. Uh, so that when you put lock, lock your piece of wood in here. And when this runs through alongside the fence, it will cut, you can see the, the taper developing. So you actually cut, this goes through the, the table dead square, but because you can offset by adjusting these, knob, these knobs here, you can adjust the angle, it gives you a taper. But the important thing is, when you lock it up, it gives you a repeatable taper. So you make six of them, or you know, if, if it's a six-sided one, or you can make an octagonal one and produce eight, and you can have whatever taper you want on here, as long as you set the angle of the blade there for the appropriate angle for the number of sides that you want to achieve. And there are formulae for that, it's all on the internet, or if you want to contact me, I'll try and help you out and tell you how to do it. Uh, there is a fairly straightforward formula, but in the middle of a talk like this, I can't remember what it is. Trust me, there is one. Okay, so that's cutting strange shapes. We're nearly there now, I think. Um, so that's the taper jig. Yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about the final bits of gluing it up, which we've touched on now with the clamping everything together. And it really is just a question of when it's all ready for gluing up, you do clamp it nice and tight with a whole variety of clamps that I have here. Different sizes, different strengths. And you can, if you want to be doubly doubly sure, use something like this. And these are all dead on 90 degrees. You can actually put those on the inside of a 90 degree joint and clamp both sides so you know it's not going to go anywhere. There's loads and loads of ways of doing that. The final carpentry bit I was going to just talk about is um, used on one of the rocket lamps. Um, Richard, if you put rocket four up again for me, please. It's there. Thank you. Now, the scale's not going to be quite right, but uh, let's, let's do this. So on rocket, you've got the actual body of the rocket and then a tapered leg coming out the side. So it, you want it to fit on there, let's say. Now, for years, I struggled when I used dowels to join things together. Drilling the holes in one piece is fine. You drill the holes in one piece, put the dowels in, but trying to work out exactly where to drill the corresponding holes in the other piece can be a bit of a nightmare. And you know, people talk about putting felt tip on top of the dowels and pressing things down. But what I've, what I've discovered is this mechanism. There's, you can buy what they call dowel pins. And these are tiny little pointy things. They, they're the same size as a dowel. So you drill the holes in one piece, wherever they've got to be. You put these pins in and they've got little points sticking up. And what you then do is the piece that's gonna go onto it, use a large piece of wood or whatever to, to hold it to the square. This piece has got to go on there, so we reference it against this edge, push it down till it just touches the pins, make sure everything's nice and solid, and just press it down slightly onto the pins. And then this piece of wood has now got a pin mark there and a pin mark where my other finger is, exactly where the centre of the holes need to be to receive the dowels for a perfect fit. So for the sake of a couple of pounds for these little pins, you can always get your joints when you're using dowels spot on. 
and I recommend these. They are super. So that's that's really that's the the end of sort of the the carpentry side of it. The final thing to do with any lamp is it's got to be wired up, and that means a hole filling down the middle of it with a drill that has to be long enough to go right the way through in one go. If you try and compromise and use a shorter drill and drill from both ends and meet the holes in the middle, if you're a channel tunnel engineer, you probably can do it. But if you're a human being like me, it never works. So get yourself a good long drill and make sure that you get it vertical before you start drilling. And you can do that with these squares or if you want to get the spirit level up there or whatever you want to do, whatever works, drill the hole down the middle. And once you've got the hole down the middle, then you can feed the wire through, fit whatever components you want on top. And the important thing about the components and when it's all done is if you're going to be selling lamps, you must get them pack tested before you can sell them. You know, the last thing you want is your, your lamps going out and someone, someone's house burns down or someone's electrocuted. So that really is, is how to make the lamps. I hope it all makes some sense. I was going to talk about where we might go from here with other things, but time is running out. So I'm happy to field any questions um, and take it from there. So that's great. Anyone, Thank you so much. There have been some questions. Yes, I'll, I'll yeah. get to them for you. Um, so the first question that came in was, um, uh, where's the first one? I skipped ahead, didn't I? What's your favourite wood to use? Asks Nora. I've probably got two fairly equal ones. I like uh, I like oak, but I, I think I'm probably erring more towards walnut these days. You can cut it with a saw, you can chisel it. It's just a little bit better to work than, I think, than oak. But those two, for me, are sort of pretty well head and shoulders above the other stuff. I mean, if you go for things like pine the sort of stuff you buy in wicks and b and q it's it's a joke you know you, you you hit it with a chisel and the whole thing just breaks apart it's nice to work you should the wood that you're using if you can push a chisel into it by hand and actually get a little sliver coming off and leave a flat surface the other side that's that's really a, it's a lovely feeling and certainly um, i'd say oak Get such nice colours down them as well. Great. Yeah, I did actually make a desk uh, out of oak and walnut because I'm so sort of keen on them. Actually, Richard, if you if we have time, could you put the desk photo up by any chance, please? Coming up now. Are you there? Oh no, have we lost you, Shane? Are oh, you still there? Great. Yeah, I'm there. Yep. Okay. There's Any other questions? Oh, here it is. Here's the desk. Oh. Yeah. So that was the desk. Yes, there are yeah. some other questions. Um, yeah. Far away. Go on. Julia asks: Are you inspired by any particular furniture maker, current or from the past? Yes. Um, when I look back, well, we, we went to um, Singleton Museum a while back and there was a little stool in there which had an absolutely marvel. It was a real medieval piece of furniture and it had the most incredible three-way join underneath the legs, which I have endeavoured to copy, I will freely admit. And in my... Um, I think there's a photo of it. I think you may have it. It's called stool. There's a round, a round sort of table with a with three legs. Um, if you can find it, Richard, put it up. If if not, don't worry. But the medieval carpenters, considering the tools they had and the tools they didn't have, they are an absolute. They, they, they were genius. The stuff they did. But modern day, I, I I haven't studied it at college. But there is a guy who lives in Worthing who is a sort of friend of mine. 
a chap called um, Brendan Devitt Spooner, and he makes bespoke furniture. And long before I got into it, I saw him making one or two things while I was in there. And it just blew me away. And I thought, if ever I could be 1% as good as him, I'll be a happy man. And, you know, he makes, he made a desk for somebody out of a single slab of oak that was about four feet wide and about eight feet long. And all the drawers on it were a different size because the guy who wanted it wanted something really unique. And Brendan just came up with this amazing design. It was all hand cut. All, you know, all the joints were hand cut. I mean, it's finished, you know, with the, the power planes and that. But it was superb. And, and Brendan's knowledge is second to none. He really is good. So he's, he's been an inspiration. He's been very helpful to me as well. I've phoned him once or twice for some advice. And he's always only too happy. So, yes, hats off to Brendan. Thank you, Brendan. Um, Okay, I think we've got the last question here is, how did you, <laughs> I mean, I think Sarah asked in shock, how did you learn to use the tool, the machines and tools, the carpentry side, tools, is what she's written. <laughs> so, I learned to do all this. So well, I've been always doing it. <laughs> the, the, sim the simpler stuff, like the hand saws <laughs> and the planes, I learned from school and all through married life and we've had houses whenever there's been any carpentry needed I've done my best with those whether it was good enough remains to be seen but yeah Rosemary's nodding that's good <laughs> um so I you know there was that um and the tools that I've got now I've learned a huge amount um off of I must confess off of the internet if you look on YouTube you can type in any type of machinery and there will be somebody, unfortunately, you, well, that's unfortunately. No, it, it, it's usually an enthusiastic American with a massive workshop attached to their house and more machinery than you, you have in the average shop in the UK. And they'll be talking through how they use this and they do this and do that. But they really are, in fairness, they, they are brilliant at it. And they, some of the things they do, you think, wow. So just carefully watching YouTube, making notes, coming out and trying it on a piece of wood that doesn't matter and then plucking up courage to try it on a piece of wood that does matter. And, you know, it, it's, there's also an English guy who I must mention, a guy by the name of Paul Sellers. And I would say to any of you, if you're vaguely interested in carpentry, look up Paul Sellers on YouTube because he does not use power tools. If he's demonstrating cutting a five foot board down the middle, he will do it with a handsaw, but he will do it with a handsaw that's 120 years old, and he will do it in about 30 seconds without even blinking. And he'll plane it down by hand. He makes all his joints by hand, and they are all immaculate when he's finished. I mean, he, he, if he hasn't been knighted, I don't know why. He's incredible. Paul Sellers, another inspiration. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so if, unless anyone else has any other questions or uh, if there's anything else that you'd like to say, Shane, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, nothing more to declare, I think. Just, you know, <laughs> like what I do. And thank you, everybody, for, you know, all, you, all you've done on this. It's been a brilliant day. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of your knowledge. It's incredible just how, how much you know and, and what you can create and what you and Rosemary have created together, actually. I think it's, yeah, just amazing. Um, so if you don't already follow what Shane does, head over to his Instagram. Shane, can you remind everyone what your Instagram is? No, I probably can't, actually, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's tree to good home. Oh, right. I might be able to operate woodwork machinery, but computers and stuff, Rosemary is the, uh, the boss. Oh, yeah. I mean, I already knew that. but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, So, yeah, go follow Shane. Come onto the Colonnade House website, um, click into the Drive to Create listing and check out the shop on our site as well to find out what Sarah and Francis and Nora and Rosemary are also doing. So this is the penultimate talk today. If you wanted to come join Nora for, head to the Eventbrite link that you did for Shane and sign up there. Um, but yes, other than that, thank you very much and uh, see you at the next talk. Bye-bye. Yep. Cheerio, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you.